tunes become familiar to you, ones that you haven't heard before, we hope you'll join in. It will help you. I know you're all really excited to hear Bill McKibben, and uh, he's in town, and he's ready to uh, uh, be here with us, but uh, we're going to pass uh, the time until 7 o'clock when the program starts. And this is called The Time Is Now, and it was written back in 2007, but it's uh, still somewhat relevant today. 
Hear the sound of glaciers cracking, falling to the warming sea. Feel the temperature arising, no more time for compromising, endless data Here's an old song with some new words. A little later tonight, we're going to sing a Pete Seeger song with some new words also. Come gather around people wherever you roam And admit that the waters around you have grown And accept it that soon if your time to you is worth saving, 
Thank you. And now for one that comes from the, what's the name of the group that you first learned this on? I just seen it on a, on a video and a lot of climate groups have been singing this song. So we'll try it together. You still got time. Can you hear me now? Let's take our time and get it right. Do we need to do a mic check? There no, we go. We got it. All right. We need to wake up. We need to wise up. We need to open up our eyes and do it now, now, now. We need to build a better future. And we need to start right now. going to do that again so you'll really know it, okay? Judy, can you uh, turn us back to that first slide for uh, the Global Warming song? And you notice on their very last, and we need to start right now, the very last time we sing it, we go into an A major. So, so rather bring up than, that voice and that energy. Can you teach this to me? <laughs> Instead of now, it's now. Let's do it. Now. Oh. <laughs> right. Here we go. Starting slower with the minor key. We need to wake up. We need to wise up. We need to open up our eyes and do it now, now, now. We need to build a better future. And we need to start by we're on a planet that has a problem. We've got to solve it, get involved in it.
wonderful world. God's counting on me. Gee, guys. going to be honoring Pete Seeger a little later and he will have a word for us on our screen. One of his most recent songs, if not his absolute finale, is called God's Counting on Me. And if you are more non-theistic than Pete, uh, you can sing Earth's Counting on Me if you'd like to. God's Counting on Me. When we look and we can see Things are not what they should be God's counting on me God's counting on you When we look and we can see Things are not what they should be God's counting on me God's counting on you
Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much to the Pilgrim Pickers. You really do pretty good picking. <laughs> The Pickers are a group from Pilgrim Place, and they just come together and make music. And we're grateful to them for making music for us for these nights and mornings of our plenary session. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, my name is Marjorie Suhaki, and I am a co-director of the Center for Process Studies and I'm privileged to be your MC for the evening plenaries of this wonderful Seizing an Alternative conference that we hope so much generates a movement where we work together for the betterment of this planet and its peoples and all of its creatures. I welcome you on behalf of... <laughs> okay. The Center for Process Studies and the International Process Network, holding its 10th international meeting in conjunction with this very conference, and the Institute for the Postmodern Development of China, which is holding its ninth Ecological Civilization Conference in conjunction with this one. And... <laughs> Pando Populous, which is a whole new generation of, of internet stuff, advertising, promoting, desiring, evoking, working together for the good of the planet and its creatures. Its website was developed in support of this conference. And so from all of these and to all of these, welcome. And now I am very proud and pleased to introduce you to a member of the Tongva tribe, Julia Bogany, who is member and elder of this tribe. The Tongvans have lived on this gracious land that we now call Southern California for centuries. And Julia Bogany is the culture program director for the tribe and we are honored and grateful to her for she's going to bless this conference with an opening prayer. Julia? Good evening. If we could stand to honor our creator. We thank the creator for bringing us here today, for giving everyone traveling mercies, for blessing each and every one to be together, to unite for the future of our Mother Earth. We just thank him because he is so great to us and he has given us this chance to unite in these three days and to learn from each other. Thank you, Julia. And now I am also very pleased and honored to introduce you to Frank Acuna. Frank Acuna has long worked with the Tongvin tribe he is a renowned botanist, an ethnobotanist. He has worked with the Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden. He's a former professor and he is expert in all things having to do with living in harmony with this land. Frank? Welcome, friends. Translation. My name is Walking Earthkeeper, tribal teacher. I am happy and proud to be here. Welcome. Let us celebrate where we live. Almost all indigenous oral tradition people see the land as the center of their physical and spiritual world. For the indigenous people of the Los Angeles Basin, the Tongva, or the Gabrielino, as the Spanish named them, the physical world was known as Urhur. The spiritual world 
Tovangar. Sky Father Waywood, in the great creation song cycle of Kwa'uar, warns us in the song to maintain the land, preserve the balance, take only what is needed, and realize that all is sacred and must be treated with respect. To do otherwise is to lose it all. Earth Mother Chahuit sings, the world is not finished. All life is shared existence, for we are the pro process of completing creation. We are. Manisar, the goddess of fertility, sings that when we were born, the world changed. Each one of us in this room, when we were born, the universe adjusted itself. When we were born, the world changed. We create the world together with the great deities of creation, goes the song. Damit, the sun god, sings that everything is waiting to be born, just as the sun is born each day. The moon god, Moar, asks us to accept the changes that she brings us. Even Tolmaluk, the great goddess of Shishonna, the underworld, sings that the world is not what we think it is. The four Torovim, the sacred dolphins that circled the world of Tovangar, celebrate life by reminding us that it is a joy to be alive and that to sing and dance is the way of prayer. And so we have come here to understand and celebrate with collective reverence this land, which we call Southern California, the Los Angeles Basin. And for us here today, this valley is a living, breathing, sensitive being and is our center of identity. A few years ago, I taught a class at Pitzer College here on the culture of the indigenous people of the Los Angeles Basin and their relation to the land that's that spiritual world called Tovangar. I asked my students to name and describe their center of place, their source of identity. Non-Californians immediately wrote of East Coast seasons, winter snows, family walks in the woods. My Californian students seemed bewildered by the assignment. But they soon came to understand that their individual identity was tied to homeland. And so too it is with our lives in Southern California, here in Claremont, and with our neighbors, families, and friends. But many have either forgotten or denied their ties to the land, or have tried to recreate an ersatz Vermont, or Georgia, or Minnesota, or Rhode Island, and in the process have almost destroyed the glory that once was Tovangar. Others have created a sterile virtual reality that leaves us empty and spiritually bored in a seamless wash of lawn green. We have closed ourselves off from the participatory life of the senses. We have insulated ourselves from the deepest source of our joy, our union with the land and all it offers. Why? Because our hearts and souls have been led to believe that we live here in an empty, weed-infested, seasonless wilderness which must be changed. And so many live here rootlessly searching for home. But once the heart feels the wonders of this place and begins to celebrate its beauty by native plant gardening that sings out, this is Los Angeles, Claremont, Montclair, Upland, Cucamonga, Azusa, Pomona, Covina, San Dimas, Glendora, Laverne, we become more human, more stable, more joyful, more aware of the glorious sense of California. By celebrating the floral world of native California, we affirm and grow into our awareness of where we are in this interwoven universe, our heritage for our children. Once the soul feels the subtle seasons 
It asks us to experience our world, not just look at it, but to become it and live it in reality, not on our hand-held electronic copies. We come to know who we are and what we are and where we are. We learn to speak to the natural world and not just about it. Then the land will cast its spell as we live with stone and air, with wind and rain, all under the influence of the breathing earth, the world of California. Our personal gardens need to glory in the yellow gold of poppy and bladder pod, brittle bush and palo verde, the reds of winter toyon and spring penstemon, the blues of lupin and ceanothus, the endless shades of green from gray blues to yellow browns, then our hearts and souls will know who we are and where we are. Our world is shrinking, the land more and more decimated, water wasted, our connections lost. By accepting California as our home, our land, our spirit, and celebrating the joy and glory of this remarkable land, we can say, this is California. This is Los Angeles. This is home. This is our place. In that creation song cycle of Kwa'uwar, the last deity to sing is Pahiot, the breath of life. He sings, remember this, all that has been said. See this, all that has been done. Understand this, all that has been presented. And give this, all that has been said, done, and pre presented. And with his divine family, he breathed life into Tovangar. And so we gather here in the land of the Tongva, in the land called Tovangar, in the city called Toriwatna, the place below Snowy Mountain. We are here to remember, to see, to understand, and to give. So, if you will all stand, please. And with the divine beings, and with Pahiot himself, let us all take a deep breath and hold it. Remember Pahiot, and as you exhale, not yet, together we will breathe life back into Tovangar. The Hobbit, it is good. Yamunhene, I go now. Thank you. We are so grateful to both of you for what the gift you have given us this evening. You know, back in 1969, most of you probably can't remember that, but I can, there was this theologian who wrote a really weird book. It had the title of, Is It Too Late? Now, it wasn't published until 1972, but it probably was a bit late, even then. Is It Too Late? A Theology of Ecology. And John Cobb, back in 1969, awoke from dogmatic slumbers, <laughs> and began to worry about the earth. It's John Cobb's genius who has brought, uh, instigated this conference and gathered us all together. So I want you to welcome John Cobb as he gives you a word of welcome. John. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I thank you not only for welcoming me in this way, but for being a part of this event. It is a 
It has involved hundreds of people, maybe now I can say thousands, in order to begin with this, in this auspicious way. So many people have given of themselves already for the causes and purposes for which we stand. And I am deeply grateful to our Tongva people for welcoming us to come in the place that was home for them for thousands of years before we could come. We come with sadness that our style of life, our way of thinking, our acts and our technology have brought to risk the land that supported them for so long when they lived in it in a human way. I hope that during this time together we will recover something of the spirit that moves these people, moved these people so long that they could be at home in a land that was beautiful and fruitful and a land that will nurture us if we allow it to do so. Thank you for coming. May we all be blessed together. John, maybe it isn't too late. We meet here in Claremont. Claremont is the city of trees and PhDs. <laughs> and it has a mayor who's very proud to be mayor of this particular town, and his name is Mayor Corey Kalaikai. And he is here to welcome us tonight to this great city. Well, distinguished friends and guests, good evening. It is indeed an honor for me to be here on behalf of our entire city council, our Mayor Pro Tem Sam Pedrosa, council members Joe Lyons, Larry Schrader, and Apanya Nasiali. And on behalf of all of them and our 36,000 residents, welcome to the city of Claremont. We're very honored to host this conference, these, these respective conferences here this weekend. And uh, thank you. I hope those of you who are visitors will take the opportunity over your time here to, to tour our town and hopefully in the interest of economic sustainability you will consider supporting many of our good merchants and restaurants here in the community and we thank you in advance for your patronage. I hope that you will find that you have selected the right place for this conference. We are a community that values our heritage, our culture and our environment. Up in the hillsides, if you even have the opportunity to tour it, we have over 1,800 acres of open space that will now be protected in perpetuity for watershed conservation and for people to enjoy uh, so that it will not be developed because we value our hillsides. Thank you. Many of you know that Mayor Eric Garcetti is touting his sustainable city plan for the city of Los Angeles we in the city of Claremont for many years have had a sustainable city plan. Going back almost a decade, former Mayor Peter Yao initiated an ad hoc committee to look at sustainability, and from the efforts of that committee, we developed our own sustainable, sustainable city plan. And furthermore from that, we developed a, an ongoing sustainability committee that uh, grades the city, continues to monitor our progress in achieving our goals and objectives under our sustainable city plan. We also have groups that have developed from that that support us to include Sustainable Claremont and the Community Home Energy Retrofit Program. Both groups have done a lot to educate the community and we've been recognized because of the number of homes in our community that have go undergone home energy retrofits. And we're very proud of that. Another thing, too, is that uh, we, we, uh, um, it, we uh, excuse me, I've, I've lost my train of thought here. I'm getting so excited. This is actually one of the largest audiences I have yet addressed, I think, ever in my career. So it's, it's a little bit uh, overwhelming. What I wanted to say is that we uh, have participated recently in the Cool California Challenge. We came in second of 
many cities that participated. Riverside, we were competing very closely. They're a little bit larger city to the east of us, but in the end, we overcame Riverside. And we are now competing in the Georgetown University Energy Prize, where we hope again to get uh, more people involved in home energy retrofits so that we can show as a community that we have reduced our energy usage. So many good things that we're doing here in the community. And most importantly, if you're gonna advance these sorts of issues and, and uh, causes, you have to live by example. And I'm very proud to say that we have a city council as a whole that lives by example, from driving uh, hybrids and energy efficient cars, to having done their home own energy retrofits, to having uh, done uh, landscape retrofits, to, to have drought tolerant landscaping, rain barrels, permeable pavement at their homes, solar energy, uh, 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 waterless, uh, uh, the water, the uh, uh, gas, water uh, tanks that are, are waterless, that, that not, <laughs> let me get this right. I usually don't need this kind of encouragement. I'm, I'm doing poorly tonight. <laughs> Tankless uh, water heaters is what I mean to say. I can, I can do this. <laughs> But again, I'm very proud to be a part of a council that lives by example, and that's very important when we're trying to advance these causes. So before I, I slip any further, I just want to again take this opportunity to thank John Cobb for the kind invitation to be here and all the organizers, and I wish you all a very meaningful, educational, and successful conference. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Well, my dears, we're not just in Claremont. We're at Pomona College in Claremont. Some of us have walked across this stage getting one degree or another. And to welcome us to Pomona College is Vice President and Chief Communications Officer, Dr. Mary Lou Ferry. She's a native of the Pacific Northwest, a lifelong environmentalist. Much of her early work was spent in Washington State's politics and government. You'll appreciate that, Corey. She worked on legislation to preserve wild um, and scenic rivers, to clean up toxic waste, and to protect and restore important watersheds, wildlife, fish, and forests. Most proudly, she worked on the successful passage of Washington State's landmark Growth Management Act. And so we welcome her as she welcomes us to this Pomona campus. Well, thank you, but first I have to correct the record. I am not a doctor. I'm just a mom and a career lady and someone who cares deeply about the environment. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. It is really my great pleasure to welcome you to Pomona College on behalf of President David Oxtoby, and he sends his very best for this successful conference. We share your commitment to bringing about a sustainable future. And we are excited about the energy and ideas that this gathering is bringing to our campus. The college has a long and dynamic history in environmentalism and conservation. Our students have a connection to the outdoors that goes back to our earliest days. The Wash, a wild preserve full of native oaks on the eastern side of campus, was set aside more than a century ago, and it remains one of our most beloved spaces. Just beyond the wash is our organic farm, planted in, yes, right? It's, how many have been to the farm stand? Okay, right, that's how you get dinner. <laughs> when, um, just beyond the wash, that's where the organic farm is, and that was uh, planned 10 years ago, and our students tend it, and every year a student that's graduating becomes the farm manager and, and does a great job passing on this tradition of appreciation for both that space and how we can be more sustainable in our food. Since 2006, every major new building on this campus has been constructed to lead standards including a pair of residence halls, which have earned LEED Platinum certification. And I think some of you are staying in those, so I hope you get a chance to try out 
all the great technology in there and maybe even sneak up to the roof and see our solar panels and garden. I think some of our students really enjoy doing that during the school year. It's a peaceful place for them. In the last few years, we've also embarked on a program of removing pavement and turf. And I think you spoke to this. You know, we've paved over so much of the beauty of California. And so we are now going about trying to repair some of that damage. And so we've been ripping out turf and pavement. And I hope you'll have a chance to even go behind this beautiful building where you'll see a native garden and a resting place that has taken over where a parking lot used to be. We're thinking really, yeah, it's beautiful. Take a, take a break back there. Uh, we're thinking really big too, led by our president and our board and the encouragement of our students and faculty, we have set an ambitious goal of achieving net carbon neutrality by 2030. Yeah. Mm. That's going to take a lot of work across this campus, but I know that uh, everyone here is up to it and has lots of good ideas to help us get there. And in fact, we know that our biggest contribution to this cause that we care about, and as um, was mentioned that I care about very personally as well, it will be our students as they go out into the world as scientists, entrepreneurs, artists, and activists committed to finding answers to the most pressing environmental challenges of our time. This is a college with a strong and expanding environmental analysis program. Do we have anyone in the house tonight? From our, okay, right. Um, where sustainability is a topic across our curriculum and where our president even teaches in an annual course in environmental chemistry, you know, in the classroom with his students, talking about climate change and how they can make a difference as they leave Pomona and venture out there. So, Over the next several days, we're really excited to hear the collective wisdom of this gathering. We've already got a taste of it tonight, so we're eager to learn from you and work together towards a healthier Earth. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy your time at Pomona College. I think we're very fortunate to be in the College of Pomona in the city of Claremont. But we are a conference that also pulls people in from other countries, India, China. And I'm very pleased to introduce you now to Dr. Yuan Li. We're graciously welcomed by him, and he represents the South China Institute of Environmental Science and the Ministry of Environmental Protection of China. He has also served as director of the Board of Environmental Pro Protection Division and as Dep Deputy General of the Nature Protection Department of the Ministry of Environmental Protection. His publications are many, but they all serve to increase the ecological responsibility and environmental, environmentally sustaining policies of the country of China. We gratefully welcome Dr. Yuan Li. Thank you very much. 今天非常高兴也非常荣幸能在克莱蒙参加第九届生态文明国际论坛暨第十届国际怀特海大会中国生态文明研究与促进会总顾问中共中央我说英文哈好好他们告诉我原来是有这个英文翻译所以我想用中文说话 Today I'm very happy and glad to 
Hornetay to 18 Knights International Force on, on a locked collaborative and 10 International White High Conference in Kremlin. As the, <coughs> as the general <coughs> Council of the China Council for the <coughs> Research and Parliament of Ecological <coughs> Correlation are <coughs> from member of the Policy Bearer of the Country Committee of the Com Com Communist Party of China, a former Vice Premier, Minister of the State Council of China, and the Vice Chairman of the Standing Com Committee of the Nine <coughs> of Nice Nation People's Congress of China, Ms. Jiang Chunyun, <coughs> uh, cares much about the convention of the conference and interests me and interest me with this case council later in which purse only by conference and <coughs> a depart to nature, replace the nature, protection nature, and take the invitation <coughs> in the return to nature in the home mirrors we can can the human being strand into the waste air of ecological cavitation. Please allow me to express the warm confrontation to the conference on, on, back, on, be, on behalf of Mr. Jiang, Jiang Chunyun and the Minister of Environment and Protection of China. <coughs> Dr. Kapoor once said, the hope of of ecological conversation lies in China. Likewise, like, likewise, Chairman Xi Jinping agrees that the world is the world is marching toward the committing of a human distance, disappearing the face that is that they excite in today's world, different interest groups, different <coughs> religious beliefs, different in the in the and different socialist state, socialist system. Eco collaboration can work as a bridge for us to call exit in peace, make our rotation hold for the competitive future, make the scientific, scientific and, technolo and the technology attention we meant do a great difference to the well-being of the human beings in the more equal sense and corrected communities of the instruct and hope the district. Their plans, such scientists and guests, from different countries, let's let's march toward the new era of e of equal colonization in the same both hand and both hand and hand and side by side, which the conference agreed suggests. Thank you. We are so honored by the presence of these international scholars here at this conference. We're very grateful to you, Dr. Yuan Li. Now, <laughs> now we have that special event of the evening. When John Cobb first began to envision this conference, this movement, this hope toward working together with many peoples from many countries toward the good of the earth, he knew we needed music, yes? And who else but Pete Seeger? And of course, the Pickers. 
Uh, so he approached, he approached Pete Seeger, knowing of, of, of his interest in Whitehead, and asked if he would be able to be with us. Well, actually, he was in his 90s, which doesn't stop some people. But, <laughs> um, but Pete Seeger felt that he, he could not commit so far away. And, and in fact, of course, he died last year. But he did make a film. He said he would make a video for us and sing a song for us and with us. And so we have that song now. We have that tape from Pete Seeger now. And we listen to it, watch it, and then join him and the pickers as the pickers lead us in singing the song for Pete Seeger. I have a kind of funny little song which I sing to children. Two times two is four, two times four is eight, two times eight is sixteen, and the hour is getting late. We've all been a-doubling, 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 all been a-doubling in 32 years. See, the world population is doubling every 32 years. Twice 16 is 32, next comes 64, next comes 128. Do we need to hear more? It's kind of funny when 20 kids are all say, we've all been a-doubling, 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 all been a-doubling in 32 years. Next comes 256, next 512. My name is Pete Seeger, and I'd like to welcome you to this conference. I wish I could attend it, but at age 94, I cannot be sure where I'll be when. When I was at Harvard briefly in 1938, I, uh, my older brother was taking a course in philosophy from Professor Alfred North Whitehead. And he said, Pete, you should come listen to this guy. He's, he's, he's really extraordinary. Whitehead says, the present holds within itself the complete sum of existence. It's a wonderful definition. The present holds within itself the complete sum of existence. Forwards and backwards, that great amplitude of time, which is eternity. <laughs> If I come out a few minutes before the hour, that's when the train to New York comes down and it aims right here, right at us. We built the cabin in 1949 in three or four pieces. I'm a big fan of the folk art of masonry. The wall over there is my best wall. It took me the whole summer. 500 feet up there, we gave some land to some neighbors. And we have one of the world's best neighbors now. We now have thousands of young maples in the woods. And we boil the maple syrup down there. I understand Eugene, whose friends were doing this on behalf of, uh, had uh, said he would love it if you felt comfortable with singing Where Have All the Flowers Gone. Is that something you'd feel comfortable doing for us? I'll get my banjo. So after Whitehead died, out came a little book called Conversations with Whitehead. And at one point, it describes Whitehead clenching his brows and clenching his fists, trying to think of the right word, and finally says, the process is the actuality. <laughs> to understand anything, understand it as a process in motion. Where have all 
the flowers gone. Long time passing. Where have all those flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Girls have picked them, everyone. When will they ever learn? Oh, when will they ever learn? I don't know where I stole the tune from. Oh, I remember now where I swiped the melody. An Irish lumberjack song. Johnson says he'll load more hay. Says he'll load 10 times a day. <laughs> and I just slowed it down. Where have all the soldiers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the soldiers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the soldiers gone? Gone to graveyards, everyone. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? And where have all the graveyards gone? Covered with flowers, everyone. <laughs> Did you get the banjo?
passing. Where has all earth's wisdom gone? Oh, oh, so long ago. Where has all earth's wisdom gone? Seek it now to carry on. So may we ever Thank you, Pickers. Thank you, Pete Seeger. Enjoy. <laughs> Now we come to the introduction of Paul Coretz, who will, in fact, introduce Bill McKibben. Now, as for Paul Coretz, he came from Los Angeles because he had to be here. He had to be here this evening asking to introduce Speaker Bill McKibben. Responding to Mr. McKibben will be um, our speaker for tomorrow evening, Vandana Shiva from India. <laughs> She is an environmental activist from India, and you will hear a longer introduction to her tomorrow because she certainly deserves one. She will be responding tonight to Bill McKibben's address. So now we welcome Councilman Coretz, who has a very distinguished career in Southern California politics, where he's been a leader on climate change issues since 2009. He was integrally involved in the city's move to divest itself of coal-fired power plants the first by mid-2016, and in instituting Los Angeles' historic solar feed-in tariff program. He co-authored the city's zero waste commercial waste hauling policy, which will institutionalize an organics recovery program to create compost, reduce methane emissions, and create healthy carbon sequestering soil as an end result. He's currently publishing three climate-related, pushing three climate-related motions, and also because of Bill McKibben's book, Oil and Honey, he wants us to know that he has been a strong supporter of a motion to allow backyard beekeeping in Los Angeles. <laughs> Well, thank you. That was such a nice introduction. Maybe I should just quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> and I'm a little nervous, too, like the mayor said. I've never been in a room with this many environmentally concerned people, which is really exciting. Let's give ourselves all a big hand for that. Now, Albert Einstein once famously said, I know not with with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought, fought with sticks and stones. We now know which weapons are being used in World War III. Propaganda, lobbyists, PR firms, and special interest money. We are fighting World War III against some vicious, greed-driven, tunnel-vision, multinational corporations. And there have been a number of front lines in this climate war. New Orleans, Myanmar, the Horn of Africa, Pakistan, Alberta, the Maldives, the Philippines, Sedona, and most recently, Texas, which flooded. Some might view the fact that the flooding occurred right after the Texas legislature banned the banning of fracking as poetic justice there. <laughs> All right, maybe that's a little too mean, but I can't help it. Now the front lines of climate change have moved to Los Angeles. I sit on the board of the Metropolitan Water District, which provides water for Southern California, and I get weekly briefings on the drought, and I'm here to tell you we're in bad shape. If we were to be really honest, it's not actually a drought at all because droughts end. 
This decades-long warming trend in the high Sierras has begun to make it impossible for us to store our water as snowpack any longer. This is the new normal. Climate change is not only here, it's here to stay. And it's partly our own fault. Los Angeles has long been infamous as the city of conspicuous consumption, fast cars and freeways, big houses and Beverly Hills lawns, and the worst air quality in the country. But we've started changing course. In recent years, we've been doing things differently, like getting the city moving off coal power, uh, banning plastic baths, launching a feed-in tariff uh, solar program, approving urban agriculture incentive zones, and now we are ripping out lawn after lawn, and I'm working to see that we replace them with rain gardens and native plants to support our struggling bees and butterflies. And of course, uh, bees are struggling everywhere, but in Los Angeles, they're doing great, so we're trying to do things to help keep that uh, the case. It's a historic time in Los Angeles, and Pando Populous has arrived just in time to help keep our momentum going. Now, when we think back to the hinges of history, there are always names associated with moments in time, moments when humankind shook itself loose from the direction in which it was headed and found a new path. I hope when we get out there in our unknown future, there are still historians around to document the names that turned human society away from the cliff that it was headed for with climate change. If so, one of the names that they're sure to remember for championing climate action longer and harder and more eloquently and more resolutely and more effectively is Bill McKibben. And if they are still around to remember him, it will be because somehow, some way, we won this war and we were able as a planet to turn our carbon dioxide emissions back towards 350 parts per million. It will mean that the worldwide effort he launched and the people he inspired to join him succeeded. The genius of Bill McKibben and his books is just as he's telling you how we're ending nature, he makes you love it even more in seeing it through his own eyes. From his descriptions of the Champlain Valley from atop Mount Abraham in Vermont, to the woods of the Adirondacks, to his descriptions of bees and beekeeping. The genius of his climate activism is that when the group he founded, 350.org, calls for an action, people from 188 countries around the world join in, including me, probably including all of us here. With the amazing work he's done on climate change and all the emissions reductions he has inspired, he is probably, on his own, ExxonMobil's personal carbon offset. <laughs> so if climate change has truly put us in the middle of World War III, I'd like to introduce you to our general. Please welcome Bill McKibben. Well, thank you very much for that very fine. I see you all are leaving now. So, uh, I don't blame you a bit. Look, it is a terrific pleasure to be here with you. Um, I may not be at the absolute top of my game for you tonight because I started the day not in the ersatz Vermont, but in the actual Vermont. Um, um, and so I've come a long ways and it's late in the evening and I'm also a little intimidated at being here. Um, the, the, uh, this um, air in the auditorium is heavy with the, um, heavy with the smell of professorial talent. Um, there's a lot of tenure in here, I think, and, and it's scaring me just a little bit, um, but I take great strength from my friend John Cobb, 
uh, who is living proof that one can be both very, very smart and very, very useful at the same time. And, um, um, and he's why I said I would come out to be here, and I'm awfully glad that I did. Um, I'm always conscious of the fact that I'm wandering into these situations where everybody is, where there's beautiful music. Boy, and what fun to see my old friend Pete Seeger talking from beyond the grave it was a really amazing and moving moment. Um, wandering into these situations where there's great music and great spirit and great feeling and great, and, and my job is just to bum everybody out. Um, um, but I will do that. I will make that my role, at least at the beginning tonight, just in order to kind of try and set the scene for this um, few days. Uh, uh, because we are here not for any intellectual excursion, because we live in the midst of a deep, immediate, practical crisis, probably the greatest crisis that human beings have ever wandered into. In civilizational terms, it came on us very fast. I mean, I wrote the first book about this, and it came out 26 years ago. Um, we've known about climate change in real terms for about a quarter century. And when we were thinking about it a quarter century ago, we thought we had a little bit more time. We thought it would be in the course of this century that we'd see big changes playing out, but we were too conservative. So far, human beings have raised the temperature of the Earth about one degree, and that one degree is already producing enormous effects. The map of the world is changing. If you look at the world from space in summertime, the Arctic looks entirely different than it did 30 or 40 years ago. We've lost as much as three quarters of the summer sea ice in the Arctic, one of the world's great physical features all but gone. The chemistry of the world is changing. We're an ocean planet and those oceans are 30% more acidic than they were 40 years ago because seawater absorbs carbon from the atmosphere and its chemistry shifts and those shifts in chemistry make it very, very hard for the creatures at the bottom of the marine food chain to make their living. The color of the world is changing. Um, you know that the snowpack up in the Sierras is gone, but the same is true up and down this continent. There was a story yesterday talking about how snow across the northern hemisphere has been steadily retreating, and as a result, the albedo of the Earth, its reflectivity, is shifting and shifting in dangerous ways. What I'm trying to say is the most basic facts, the basic, biggest physical features on this Earth are now influx and influx for the first time in our civilization's history. The most important thing that happened in the lifetime of everyone in this room was sometime in the last 20, 25 years, we invisibly crossed the line that took us out of the Holocene, the 10,000 year period of benign climatic stability that coincided not coincidentally with the rise of human civilization. Every human being that we know about, that we have records of lived in the Holocene, but not us. We live in what comes next and the practical effects are already upon us. Yes, the drought in California is terrible, Terrible. The drought in California is not as bad as the drought has been in other parts of the world. The academics are pretty clear now that it was the worst drought in the history of the Fertile Crescent that helped kick off the horrible civil war in Syria that's now spread across the Middle East. Millions of people had to leave their farms and crowd into cities, and with that, as often happens, started to come conflict. It's not just drought, it's not just the hotter world drying up more of the water. Once that water is up in the atmosphere, it's going to come down. And increasingly, it comes down in deluge. 
You watched what happened in Texas and Oklahoma last week. You saw the pictures, but the numbers are way scarier even than the pictures were. We've been keeping records in Texas and Oklahoma since 1895 of rainfall, so we know how much rain has come down every month since 1895. May of this year, Oklahoma beat the old rainiest month in history by 24% and Texas by 17%. Those of you who know anything about statistics and about large data sets know that that's statistically absurd, statistically impossible, but it happens and it's possible because the world of those old records is not the one we live in anymore. The world we live in is different. The world we live in this week, uh, uh, India is suffering through a heat wave of remarkable dimension, thousands of people dead, the very pavement melting, the fifth deadliest heat wave in the planet's history and almost all of them in the last few years. 2014 was the warmest year in human history and so far it looks like 2015 is going to crush that record. But we're still at the beginning of all of this. As I said, we have raised the temperature of the planet one degree and we seem certain to come close to raising it too even if we did everything right but we're not doing everything right on the current track at which we're emitting CO2. We're going to raise the temperature four or five degrees Celsius, seven, eight, nine degrees Fahrenheit before this century is out and if we do that then we cannot have a civilization like the one we enjoy in any of its dimensions just Think about how profoundly transformed that world would be. Temperature has gone up one degree and already it's incredibly difficult to carry out agriculture in places like California. Imagine what it's like if we just keep going up and up and up. We can't let that happen. And the good news, and there is at least a little bit of good news. The good news is that we know now how we would solve this problem if we wanted to solve it. The scientists did their job in warning us about this problem and the engineers have done their job in helping us understand what we could switch to from coal and gas and oil. When we talked about renewable energy 25 years ago, we mostly did it with our fingers crossed, but no more. In the last six years, the price of a solar panel has come down 75% across huge swaths of the planet now. The cheapest way to produce power is with the solar panel. And in a few places where we've really gone to work, you can see how renewable energy scales up. The Danes generate about 40% of their power now with wind. There were days last week when they were generating more than 100% of their power needs from the wind and shipping the rest of it off to Germany. The Germans generate some days this summer 80% of their power from solar panels within their borders. Costa Rica, which has worked hard on this, ran for the first four months of this year entirely on renewable electricity. We could easily scale this up, not for free, not without effort, but we could do it. Yesterday, a group of scientists and economists calling themselves the Apollo Coalition from all over the world said that with an effort comparable to the one that went into producing the moonshot of, of the 1960s, we would be able by 2025 to be running the world on renewable energy. And if we did, it's not just that it would be solving the problems of climate change, it would also be solving the equally horrible problems of pollution around the world. We're used to thinking of California and Los Angeles as a smoggy place, but it's cleaner than it used to be, and even at its worst, it's nothing compared to what it's like right now today in places like Delhi. There was a study that came out this week indicating that Delhi, which has the worst air in the world now, um, um, that half the children there, 2.2 million children, have irreversible lung damage. We think that one in six people in India now die as the result of air pollution. And there's lots of other people there without any access to energy at all, living far off 
any electric grid for whom the cheapest, quickest way to get some access to some of what we enjoy would be the quick dispersal of renewable energy to all those places. And yet, and yet, as of now, we're not doing these things. We're not engaged in an Apollo project to put up renewable energy. We're not knocking ourselves out to make things happen. Just the opposite. If you look at, say, Washington, you could argue fairly effectively that we've engaged in a 25-year bipartisan effort to accomplish nothing. And it's been pretty much entirely successful. <laughs> All of which, and since this is a conference of philosophers, all of which makes this not just an urgent question, but an interesting one, one which has some things to say about our civilization. The effects of climate change are like an asteroid strike. That's the same damage that we're going to do, the same kind of extinction rates and things. But its causes aren't like an asteroid strike. It's not some bolt from the blue. It's obviously bound up in who we are and how we've organized our lives, which makes it an illuminating question. One could talk for a very long time about all the different possibilities from psychology and theology and every place else about how we've come to think of the world and treat the world the way we do. But for practical purposes, my colleagues and I think that the single biggest answer and the one we need to address most immediately, the best explanation for why we've done so little about the problem that we face, the crisis that we face, lies in the power of the fossil fuel industry. It's the richest industry on earth and it's been able to exploit that wealth to keep change from happening and continues to do so. Last week, even amidst those record rains in Texas, even as people were being pulled from swollen rivers, the CEO of Exxon got up at their annual meeting and as uh, reporters put it, mocked renewable energy and said that if there turned out to be any problem with climate change, like inclement weather, as he put it, or sea level rise, then we would develop technologies to deal with that. Um, Shell dumped all its solar and wind investments over the last few years. Instead, in the single greatest act of um, greed-fueled irony that the world has ever seen, Shell is leading the charge up north, having melted the waters of the Arctic. They did not say, maybe we should go into the solar business. They sold their solar business and said, now that we've melted the Arctic, it'll be easier to drill up there for more oil. There's really nothing quite more emblematic of our craziness than that, but it goes on and on. The Koch brothers, taken together, are the richest man on earth. They've made their money in oil and gas. They're the biggest leaseholders up in the tar sands in Canada. They've announced they're going to spend $900 million on the next federal election in this country. They'll spend more money than the Republicans or the Democrats, Koch brothers, party of two. And they will spend it to make sure that the status quo remains in place. Left to their own devices, all these guys are able, I think, to delay change long enough to break the planet. The renewable energy gets cheaper all the time. The gains in engineering haven't been enough yet to allow us to overcome the huge, huge century-long head start that fossil fuel gets, nor the amazing subsidies that it's able to win with its political power. The International Monetary Fund estimated last year that each year, the world generates about $5.3 trillion in subsidy for the fossil fuel industry. What's interesting for me is the question of whether these guys are beatable, and if so, how. And I think, though I don't know, I think that they are. It's going to take a very different kind of movement than we've ever seen before, but that's beginning to form. 
Now, global consciousness, global consciousness, is one of those phrases, frankly, to which I'm somewhat allergic. Um, it sounds kind of hippy-dippy. Uh, on the other hand, this is the first truly global problem that we've ever faced, and our elites are not solving it, our systems are not working, and so we are going to need a global grassroots movement. They have most of the money lacking it. We need another currency. And the only currency we have to work with is the currency of movements, passion, spirit, creativity. Um, so let's talk about these things. I'm going to try and show a few, see if this works, try and show a few pictures here for you all and just give you a sense of who your brothers and sisters in this fight are because they now come from everywhere. We started 350.org seven years ago now, myself and seven college students um, up there in Vermont. And um, we had no idea what we were doing and no money and no whatever, but we had great desire to go out and organize the world, ludicrous as that sounds, and so we just sort of set about it. We tried to find people like ourselves all over the place, and there's not everywhere something called an environmentalist, but everywhere there's someone who cares about uh, hunger and food, about public health, about development, about war and peace, about women's rights, about all the things that will not exist on a quickly degrading planet, and so those were the people we tried to pull together. We asked everybody, this is now six, five, six years ago, to come together for this first big day of action that some of you took part in. We picked almost at random a, a, a weekend, a Saturday in the fall, um, at least fall in the Northern Hemisphere, and um, we didn't know how it would go. We had no real reason to expect that we'd be able to pull this off, because no one really had ever tried, and um, but we got the first sense that it might kind of work. Two days early, on the, a Thursday, we were sitting around our little office, the eight of us doing our last minute chores, putting out press releases, and the phone rang, the satellite phone rang, and it was our leader in Ethiopia, and like many of our leaders, probably most of them, she was a she, and like many of them, she was 17, and, and she was in tears. And she said, the government's taken away our permit for Saturday. So we're going to do this today before they can stop us. And that was brave, because it's not a very nice government. But that wasn't why she was in tears. She just kept saying, we want to do this the same day as everybody else. We didn't want to jump the gun. We want to be part of the big thing. And, and we have uh, right now, I don't know, there we go. We have right now, she said, out in the street, 15,000 kids chanting 350. Okay, so we were like, Luau, don't worry about the date, it's okay. Um, um, and it was okay, and you know, we went on to organize very quickly. That, that, that weekend, there were 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries around the world. CNN described it as the most widespread day of uh, political activity in the planet's history. And it was beautiful to watch. Beautiful to watch for me because I'd always heard this thing that environmentalism was something that rich white people did and if you didn't know where your next meal was coming from you wouldn't be an environmentalist and on and on and it took about 10 minutes of watching those pictures which I hope we can keep showing yes watching those pictures we don't need to look at me you can, you know, watching those pictures come in from around the world for it to be entirely clear to me anyway that most of the people we were working with were poor, black, brown, Asian, and young, because that's what most of the world actually consists of. And what do you know? People exactly as interested in the future as anybody else, um, maybe more so, because you know, if you're in some of those places, the future bears down very hard on you. And there was a great deal of beautiful creativity shown in many parts of the planet and remarkable leadership from uh, uh, religious communities for the first time. There's the head of Muslim South Africa, the head of kind of indigenous groups next to him, behind him in this scarlet, the Anglican Archbishop, 
the head of this huge multi-faith march. There's, you know, our biggest evangelical college. That's where Billy Graham went. Uh, I'd been to the Middle East to do some organizing, not an easy place to get to, obviously. Uh, you know, in Bethlehem, there were barriers everywhere. We were trying to bring together people from all sort of countries, but because the Dead Sea is shrinking so rapidly as, as it warms, but there were too many armies in the way, and so the Jordanian said, we'll make the big three on our beach, and the Palestinian said, we'll do the five on ours, and the Israelis took care of the zero on their shore, and it was beautiful. And there were 300 big demonstrations across China, which was really important, and those are our brothers and sisters in the Maldives, illustrating the existential problem that comes when the sea begins to rise, as it is now rising. That's the Student Government Association holding their meeting in the lagoon. Um, 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 this is paradise, the Maldives, you know. It's, um, Vandana, you've probably been there sometime. It's the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. Um, uh, 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 all islands, of archipelago, 1,200 islands strung out across the equator in the Indian Ocean. Um, the only problem with the whole place is that the highest spot is about a meter and a half, two meters above sea level, which is a hell of a bad place to be in the 21st century. But they're working like crazy. Everybody working like crazy. This was the biggest story on Google News for about 36 hours, and I always thought that it was because most of the demonstrations didn't, most of the people didn't look the way that, that editors thought environmentalists for us to look like. So there's Yemen, which is as tough a place as there is in the world, and that zero is all women in full black burqa. So to us, they don't look like, you know, the local chapter of the Sierra Club, but their hearts are in exactly the same place. They're thinking not about themselves, but about the future, about the community. The same all over the world. There were three or 400 pictures that ended up in a file just marked 350 adorable. Um, and they were indeed adorable, and they were also really hard to look at. Look, those girls are likely to be refugees before the century is out and not through anything they've done. So we've kept up this kind of stuff. We think we've organized about 20,000 of these demonstrations all over the world in every corner of it, and it's been beautiful and fun and work that I really love. Um, um, and we'll keep doing it. Um, um, but you know what? Um, at a certain point, at, we've even done these huge art projects. They call them the biggest art projects in the world. So many people, you had to get sort of satellites to, to take the picture. There's a picture from Santa Fe of one of the dried out riverbeds they have there, just like they do here. But when the um, satellite came over, a few thousand people flung blue blankets up overhead just to bring it back to life for a minute. And it's, a, it's a beautiful picture. I kind of wish we'd just keep doing that work forever and ever. Um, and I think if we had 50 years to solve this problem, that's what we would do, because it's kind of education in action and beautiful to do. But we don't have 50 years. We, sh we Basically, we had to start 25 years ago, you know, if we were going to deal with it, solve it. And so, instead, we've tried very hard to learn how to kind of up the ante, raise the stakes, become not just educational, but confrontational, and, and pretty fast. Um, so, there we go. Um, some of you have um, followed, for instance, these fights that have sprung up around uh, uh, infrastructure around the world. We kind of began it, in a sense, in 2011 with the fight about the Keystone Pipeline. Now this fight had been going on for a little while already, waged by our indigenous brothers and sisters on both sides of the border in this continent. The rise of kind of First Nations environmentalism is one of the great stories of the last three or four years, and it's one of the things that's just propelling this movement forward so fast. I'm on my way to Minnesota tomorrow to march with a lot of Native Americans working on big pipeline things up there in the upper Midwest. But, but that, that, but that pipeline was going to go through like all pipelines have always, gonna, have always gone through. It was an absolutely done deal. There was a poll of energy insiders in Washington in 2011 that summer 
300 energy insiders, lobbyists, committee staff, things, and 91 percent of them said that TransCanada would have their permit for the Keystone Pipeline by the end of 2011. But then Jim Hansen at NASA put out a paper saying there's so much carbon up there in the tar sands that if you burn it all you'll never get the climate under control. And then people began to come out of the woodwork to fight. That's what that picture is of. It's of the beginning of what became the largest civil disobedience action about anything in this country in about 30 years. 1,200 and some people went to jail. I bet a few of them are in this room tonight. And it was beautiful. And, and, and it started spreading all over the world. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, back to Washington. And a month later or two months later, we were ringing the White House with thousands upon thousands of people standing shoulder to shoulder all around the White House. And, and that was in 2011, and right about then, Barack Obama said, okay, maybe we should put this on hold for a while, at least until after the next election. Um, and he did, and then we kept fighting, and so he kept it on hold through the next election after that. Um, that's been a lot of elections now, and it's been a better part of four years, four years when we've been able to keep thanks to the work that you all have done, eight or 900,000 barrels a day of the dirtiest oil on earth underground. We're causing big financial problems for the people up in the tar sands by doing it. Uh, uh, three huge projects were canceled last summer, even before the price of oil began to fall, because the companies that were thinking of building these big new expansions knew that they had no real way to get this stuff to market. Now Canadian people, led by First Nations people, have blocked the route that goes to the west, to the Pacific. Now they're blocking the route that goes to the east. We hope that we're going to win this Keystone fight sometime in the next few months, but we don't know. We do know that by doing it, we've been able to launch a kind of groundswell of action against every kind of bad fossil fuel infrastructure. There was a speech last week by the head of the American Natural Gas Association who was talking to his industry and saying, we have somehow got to stop the keystoneization of every pipeline in the country. Um, that was music to my ears. They are never going to build one of these for free again. Um, we are going to, we are going to stop, we are going to stop planned coal ports along the Pacific Northwest. There were six of them proposed three years ago. We've already beaten four of them, and the other two are going to fall. We're going to stop. Um, we've already watched amazing organizing bring fracking to an end in New York State, and we are, we are determined. We are determined to bring fracking to an end in California. So it... So it no longer mars the environmental record of this state. Let me just say, if you want the definition of obscenity, it's in the middle of a drought to be taking millions of gallons of water and putting it in a hole in the ground in order to produce more oil that will make the next drought worse. Um, so there are these huge battles going on, and they're going on everywhere. I was talking this morning with my colleagues in Australia who are battling this huge mine, uh, the biggest coal mine in the world if it gets built in the Galilee Basin, but I think we're going to win there too. And there is just beautiful in every corner of the world. Um, we calling it, keep it in the ground, you know, this understanding that we can't build these huge new fossil fuel things that will keep us hooked to this stuff for another few decades. But, man, it's like playing whack-a-mole. It's too many of them all the time. If that's all we do, eventually we're going to get overwhelmed because they just keep coming. That's why, instead of just playing defense, we're doing our best to play offense, too, to push back hard against these guys. That's what this divestment movement that we started a couple of years ago was about. Um, now, I, I wrote the, the kind of article that helped launch it th just about exactly three years ago. It was in Rolling Stone. If you keep your back issues, it was the one with Justin Bieber on the cover. And, um, but it turned out that I got a call from the editor a couple of days later saying, something weird's going on. There's, your piece has 10 times as many likes on Facebook as Justin Bieber's. Um, 
which I attribute in part to my soulful gaze, you know, but, um, um, but more to the fact that it had a whole new set of numbers in it. I was working with this data that had just come out from some financial analysts in London who'd done something we should have done long ago. They added up how much fossil fuel, how much carbon the fossil fuel industry already had in its reserves, the coal and oil gas it had mapped and announced that it would plan to burn. And it turns out that there's about five times as much carbon in those reserves as would take us past the two degree red line limit that's the one limit the world has ever set. It's not a very good limit. If one degree melts the Arctic, we're idiots to find out what two degrees will do. But that's the only thing the world's ever agreed on, the only even beginning of a line in the sand that we have. And at the moment, if we follow the business plan of the fossil fuel industry, we are going to soar past it. They've got five times as much. They're not normal companies. They're rogue companies. If they follow their business plan, the planet tanks. There's no need to have conferences like this one. The end of the story is written, at least it's written in their promises to their shareholders and their lenders and things. Unless we can change that script and change it fast, then this isn't gonna work. But we are changing that script, at least as fast as we can. Um, this divestment movement is turned into an enormous crescendo began small the first few months, a few sort of environmental colleges and things in far-flung corners of the world. But then it just started rocketing along. Places like Stanford began to get involved. Then last fall, on the day when we had 400,000 people marching through the streets of Manhattan in the biggest day of climate protest in the planet's history. That was beautiful. And just as beautiful was that evening when Uptown, the representatives of the Rockefeller family, announced that they were divesting their philanthropies, billions of dollars from coal and gas and oil. And that's pretty amazing if you think about it. There's. There's the first, the first family of fossil fuel, okay? The original oil fortune. And they said it's no longer financially prudent or morally okay to be invested in this stuff. They'd heeded the call from people like Desmond Tutu, demanding action. And I knew that that was a watershed moment. I knew in a sense that that day marked the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel age. The only question is how fast that end will come and whether we can make it happen fast enough to affect the runaway physics of climate change. But it's been amazing to watch in the last few, even the last few weeks, the kind of people that have joined this fight. Um, um, Oxford University, the oldest university in the English speaking language, uh, the Church of England, the University of Hawaii, which had some of your local experts, thank you, Mr. Hooper, out from, um, um, from Pitzer College, which had divested, went out there to the University of Hawaii and helped them figure out how to do it. Um, some of the things were just beyond belief. Uh, last week, the largest insurance company in France with uh, 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 about $500 billion worth of assets under its management announced that it was divesting from coal. Yesterday, uh, 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 Actually, tomorrow, we're almost certain that tomorrow, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway, the biggest single pot of money in the planet, $962 billion, will announce its divestment from coal. Um, um, <laughs> earlier today, earlier today, Georgetown University announced that it was beginning to divest. Um, um, that's beautiful news. That's one of the two most important Catholic colleges in the nation. The reach of that Jesuit Pope is really beginning to demonstrate <laughs> things. Earlier today, earlier today there was a story in The Guardian about a speech last night from the former chairman of Shell Oil. And the former chairman of Shell Oil said, <coughs> the oil industry is doing nothing to solve this problem. It's making the same 
mistakes it's been making for 20 years. It has no intention of solving it. He said divestment is the rational response. So we're hopeful that every denomination will join in, that they'll follow the Unitarians, the United Church of Christ, and the Church of England in divesting. We're hopeful that every college will join in, including, uh, without at the risk of being a slightly ungrateful guest, including Pomona. It's, um, it's incredibly important. It's incredibly important to have solar panels and, and lead certified buildings and things but the endowment is just as much a part of the university as the dining hall, and if one of them's gonna be green, they both should be. Um, um, so, the point is, none of this happened by accident and none of it happened for free. It happened because people got involved in movements and made it happen. There were big sit-ins and civil disobedience at so many of those colleges and schools and places, and that vision is sort of spreading around the world, and it needs to spread far more. So we need all of you engaged, and we need you engaged in every kind of way. Most of it is the normal work of writing letters and calling officials. California Senate yesterday voted to divest CalSTRS and CalPERS from coal, which is very good. Um, it goes now, and, and Senator Kevin DeLeon was the key guy and a, and a good guy, um, but it goes now to the assembly where it's going to be a harder fight. So those of you who know who your assembly person is, call, and those of you who don't, shame on you and look it up. Um, 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 we got to fight here in California fracking. We got to fight at all the universities and colleges that y'all come from. Um, we've got to fight for divestment. Um, find a battleground and dig in, join this movement, and join it in a serious way. I said that this was the biggest battle that we've ever faced as a civilization, and I meant it. There's nothing we've ever come up against that's as big, and there's nothing that we've ever come up against where the action that we have to take has to be taken now. Most times that we face social problems, wars, they stand there and wait for us to do something about it. And, you know, those who fought in the civil rights movement had to be very, very brave more dangerous than to be an environmentalist. People got killed, they got shot. Um, um, at least in this country, that's not happening yet to environmentalists, though it is in other places around the world. But, but they did have in the civil rights movement an advantage that we don't have, which was complete confidence that eventually they would prevail. Dr. King ended every talk. He would say the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. He was quoting from Theodore Parker, the abolitionist minister. The arc of the physical universe is short, and it bends toward heat. If we don't get this done soon, then we don't get it done, which is why, along with writing and calling and Facebooking and all the other things that we do now, which is why we also need some of you engaged in those ways that humans have traditionally, at least for the last hundred years, summoned up the energy, the moral energy to change the world. When people look back on the 20th century, they will not conclude that the great invention was nuclear energy. I think they'll think that that was more or less a kind of dead end, you know. Um, they'll think 100 or 200 years from now that the greatest technological innovation of the 20th century came from India and that it was the technology of nonviolent direct action. Um, um, and. Some of you engaged in it. Now, I say this 
more easily than I usually do because as I look out at this audience, I notice that we could call this the Whitehead Conference for more reasons than one. Um, 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 I always am a little reluctant to tell young people to go off and get arrested. Because if you are 22 right now in our economy, it's possible that an arrest record is not the single best thing for your resume. But one of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is, past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you? And when I asked people, when I wrote the letter asking people to come to Washington and get arrested, um, that was one of the things I said. We don't want young people to be cannon fodder here. So it was good fun, though young people are leading this movement. It was good fun to see that the people who volunteered to do that were often of an age. Now, we did not ask people as they were getting arrested, how old are you? That would be rude. We did cleverly say, I think, who was president when you were born? And <laughs> the two biggest cohorts came from the FDR and Truman administrations. On the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet handle with care. He was... He was old enough that he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration, and that was long enough ago I'd almost forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. Um, um, but that was beautiful. And the young people who were there saw their elders acting the way that elders are supposed to act in a working society, okay? in a working civilization. So I asked you, to help in some of these ways. And I ask you to do it without any guarantee that we're going to win. Um, there is none. It's possible that we've waited too long to get started. We're clearly not going to stop global warming. That's no longer on the menu. But maybe we can keep it from getting completely out of control. The physics indicates that even that is a stretch at this point and will require, well, it's a narrow window and it's closing fast and it means working with incredible speed and power to make transformative change in short order. We know what those changes should be, the kind of things that would really help us. We desperately need a price on carbon to reflect the damage that it does in the atmosphere. And we desperately need a kind of World War II style effort to take renewable energy now and put it to use every place around the world. We know we need those things, but we can't have them right now because the power of the fossil fuel industry is so great that it holds our capital and most other capitals. It holds Delhi and Beijing and many others in its thrall. It keeps us from making that kind of change. And unless we can break that power, little will happen. I can't guarantee that you can, but I can guarantee, and this is the thing I want to leave you with, I can guarantee that those of you who are in this fight, you're not in it alone. That every place, every place around the world now, there are people engaged, fighting. There are people meeting tonight in rooms like this in every continent and in most countries. And, they are trying to figure out what they can do and how they can do it together with other people. In this century, we've been given this gift to make use of for the first time, the ability to really link up and come together. It's not an unmixed blessing, the internet, but it is perhaps the kind of blessing that we need if we can figure out how to knit ourselves together fast enough, if we can figure out how to use it, not to trade petitions on email, but to bring people out into the real world to get them engaged in this fight. No guarantee we're going to win, but there is a guarantee that we're going to fight. And what an honor it is to get to do it shoulder to shoulder with you all. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. And again, a thank you to John for bringing us all together. Um, and this opening ceremony for me was very special because it brought together the First Nations of this land. And I think one of the big errors of history has been the assumption that Columbus discovered America. <laughs> if, oh, so we need to get rid of that one. And the second big error is the 250-year-old error that progress depends on fossil fuels. If we get those two removed, we'll do very well. <laughs> and the fact that you have China and India, um, and I think they are amazing powers. They are amazing powers to show another path of an ecological civilization. The fact that we've been around so long shows that on our own terms, we did get it right. But the reason China and India are being celebrated is for this crazy indicator called growth, which didn't last in the industrial countries, and it's not going to last on fossil fuels in China and India. And so I'm so glad there's such large numbers of our Chinese brothers and sisters here to evolve the deeper ideas for an ecological civilization, which I've been referring to as Earth democracy, after Seattle, when they said the anti-globalization movement knew what it was against. We didn't know what we were for. So I said, well, we'll write and tell you. We are for the planet. We are for community. We are for love. We are for compassion. We are for creating abundance and security for all. We are not for the 1%. And to be critical of a model that benefits the 1% is not being illiterate, but knowing a little more of process and relationship. So I come from India, I come from the Himalaya, and I was so happy to hear the mayor talk about how the hills will not be developed. Now, isn't there something strange that when we want to protect something for its beauty and ecological functions, we say it won't be developed? And something's wrong with development if we have to keep it out of everything that's precious. And something's wrong with growth if all it's giving us is more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, more polluted water, in India, more farmers dying, 300,000 have committed suicide. The heat wave right now has killed 2,500 people. But just about three weeks before that, when we should be having spring, we had hailstorms and rains in an untimely way at harvest time, which destroyed about 50% of the crop of North India, which is the food belt and the food basket. Um, and two years ago, of course, the glaciers of the Himalaya are melting, and you know, within the century, they won't be there, which means the snow that s provides water to half of humanity, the Himalaya is the water base for half of humanity, it won't be there. And we need to prepare for it. Maldives, being as low as it is with sea level rise, you said is not the best place to be. But what is a good place to be with this climate havoc? You know, you, you think you're in a dry area, you get a flood. You think you're in the mountains and not near the sea, so you're safe. But you get glacial melt, heavy rain. And two years ago, 2013, just two days, 16th and 17th of June, we got such intense rain that with the glacial uh, lake bursting and the rains and the maldevelopment um, in my region of the Ganges catchment, 20,000 people were washed away. So we are talking of devastation and death today, not way down in the future. When the climate treaty was written, they always talked about 100 years down the line. Now, 
is happening now. And I could go on uh, with examples from my region and in my short life, uh, where the last 20 years have created instability like we've never seen. Um, Bill referred to the Fertile Crescent, the Syrian unrest. 2009 was a very severe drought. 80% of the crop failed. 70% of the animals died. And the people moved into cities. And then Assad, of course, brought out his police and armies. And the West armed the rebels. Before you know it, those arms are now creating a third entity called ISIS. The word didn't exist in newspapers before a few years. The word Boko Haram in Nigeria did not exist before 2009. And we've just done a manifesto called Terra Viva um, on what's happening to the soil and the land and the climate and the future of life on Earth. And the Secretary General, former Secretary General of the Desertification Convention was with us. And he's from that area. And he showed maps of how Lake Chad has disappeared, which supported agriculture, supported pastoralists. There's no water, their livelihoods are gone, and today they're fighting each other. And it is interpreted as if it is a religious problem. It's a problem of making life unlivable. There is no religion that is saying destroy the earth. All religions, and I think there will be the wisdom discussion in the tracks um, during this conference. But when you look at what the religions are saying, all of them are saying the same thing about protecting the planet, taking care of each other. Um, and I think we really need to work together to stop allowing the misuse of religion in perpetuating war, <laughs> as well as maldevelopment. Now, I, of course, have spent the last 30 years uh, working with agriculture, and about 15 years ago wrote uh, my book, Soil Not Oil. And I, th I think we really need to keep fossil fuels underground. They were never meant to become the basis of life on Earth. Life is better without fossil fuels, I can tell you, because we have a fossil fuel-free farm. Um, but I think we need to increase more carbon in the soil, because part of what's happening is the rupture of the carbon cycle, something you learn very early in life. What goes out should be reabsorbed by the biosphere. We are not allowing its reabsorption because we are destroying the capacity, but we are emitting far more than could be absorbed. And we've done the calculations with agriculture. Um, my book, Soil Not Oil, I worked out that 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions are coming from the same model of the economy and development in agriculture that is leading to greenhouse gases. 40% of the carbon dioxide, the nitrogen oxide, which is 300 times more lethal for destabilizing climate patterns, and methane. You don't have to have methane emissions if you don't put animals in factory farms and don't waste half the food. You won't have nitrogen emissions if you're not using synthetic fertilizers. In fact, our leguminous plants are designed to take nitrogen out of the air and fix it. That's why the First Nations always grew the three sisters, the corn and the beans and the squash. We have the capacity to not just mitigate, but adapt. And the calculations are that with two tons per hectare of increased organic matter and carbon in the soil, we could actually close that emissions gap of 10 gigatons and bring down the atmospheric pollution and carbon dioxide load to 350 with a combination of keeping the carb fossilized carbon, the black carbon underground, and making the green carbon, which is life, increase. And we've got to make a shift from the black and the deadly and the destructive to the living. 
And the beautiful thing is that it doesn't just help us mitigate, it helps us adapt. Uh, when we have these untimely rains, I was getting calls from our farmers from across northern India, and they would say, in India, everyone becomes a relationship. You know, I'm everyone's didi, elder sister. And um, the didi, I used our seeds and I did organic, as you've taught us, and my crop was standing. It did not get destroyed by the rain. Because the soil has more water absorption capacity and there's more resilience in the plants. So we need to think more of resilience. We need to think more of how does a small farmer, small community survive today with the impacts, or the impacts that are going to be there, as Bill pointed out. But what's good for the climate is also good for food security. We actually end up producing more food. It's good for dealing with the water crisis like the drought, who's so happy to be taken by a former student to a garden he's made by tearing up their lawn. And they're actually generating water in terms of water harvesting now from their little urban plot. And I, you know, the, uh, the messages from both the councillor from Los Angeles and the mayor that this drought has to become California's moment of making a shift. Making a shift from the fossilized thinking of a fossil fuels base, because it is fossilized thinking, you know. It's so old and obsolete and out of tune with what we need. It's, but it's good for local economies, it's good for the soil, and 2015 is the year of soil. And as the situation shows with what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Africa, it's good for peace. If the soils are fertile and people are growing food and we've stabilized the climate, people will stay home. Refugee creation is part of the same process that's putting too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is pushing people off the land and out of their homes. <laughs> And I'm just so happy with the diverse movement because when I was a young student, we were fighting against apartheid. And apartheid was won because of precisely that withdrawal of the world support to keeping the apartheid regime around. What we are facing today is what I call eco-apartheid. Apartheid means separation. Eco-apartheid means this pretense that we are separated from the planet both in terms of a progress that's based on destroying the planet, and in our minds, every model of science and economy and technology uh, defined in terms of an escape. And while we need the financial divestment, I think we also need a moral, ethical divestment from our, through our lives and the way we live. And that withdrawal, the good thing is that that withdrawal from the fossil fuel economy and that withdrawal from an industrial agriculture based on the fossil fuel economy actually improves our lives. It builds communities. It rebuilds local economies. And actions that make Exxon and Shell irrelevant to our lives are the same actions that make the Monsantos irrelevant to our lives. I remember a few, I think a few months ago, I sent you a message, Bill, saying the fight for protecting the biodiversity and life of this planet and the fight for arresting dangerous climate change are the same fight because the players, you call them, um, basically, you nearly call them gangsters and criminals, which I would totally agree with you. Um, I call it a mafia economy of the 1%. Uh, and I want to just tell you two things which connect the two issues. Monsanto has bought up the single biggest climate data corporation in the world. And this bought up the single biggest soil data corporation of the world. So they're preparing for using climate change to expand their control and expand their hold. We have to do what you said, turn nonviolent action 
into a celebration of our capacity, our potential, our freedom. Gandhi's word for it was satyagre, the fight for truth, the force of truth, and the force of the truth of this planet and its laws, and the force of the truth of our humanity and our capacities. I do not think any amount of criminal action can extinguish that. So let's take a pledge. Second October is Gandhi's birth anniversary, the day of Satyagraha, recognized by the United Nations. Let's turn it into a big celebration of a better life, a better worldview, a better Earth community. I'll be at Gandhi's ashram taking a pledge. I hope each of you will, wherever you are. What a duo and what a challenge. We have heard the challenge and we're here to meet it. Thank you for coming and join now with our pilgrim pickers as we have our theme song for the night. Thank you. When we look and we can see Things are not what they should be. God's counting on me. God's counting on you. Oh, when we look and we can see, things are not what they should be. God's counting on me. Thank you. God's counting on you.
Now, uh, it's past my bedtime, but we're going to play a few more. And if I don't fall asleep in the middle of it, uh, we'll just keep on going. But we understand some of you uh, need to be on your way. We're going to do uh, Where Have All the Green Fields Gone again now. Where have all the green fields gone? Long time passing. Where have all the green fields gone? Long time ago. Where have all the green fields gone? Cloud and plundered everyone. When will we ever learn? Seek it now to carry on, so may we ever learn, so may we ever learn. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to do one as you're finding your way. I'll take off your shoes which uh, I wrote the original version of it back in the 1970s, and uh, we've updated a little bit, but the first verse is from that long ago. Oh, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. The earth is our God's and the fullness thereof, from the waters beneath to the heavens above. So take, take, take off your shoes, cause you're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. On the eighth day of creation, will our God look around? The power plants and freeways and the trash on the ground. Plantation throwing rubber where the grain should be high. You couldn't see the sun for all the smog in the sky. Well, kids, you really fill the earth and then you subdued it. But there's nothing in my book that says you've got to pollute it. So take, take off your shoes. Cause you stand and on my holy ground. You stand and on my holy ground. For what you call the carbon to the air and sea and land. What part of global woman do you not understand? 
understand. If I was a commodity, we're fighting for. It's time to learn the sanity that cuts his floor. So take, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Take, take off your shoes. Are you standing on holy ground? The earth is our God, said the fullness thereof. From the waters beneath to the heavens above, so take, take, take off your shoes. Are you standing on my holy ground? You're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. Bill McKibben's book, Earth, on page 170, he gives an example of the diversity that we need to have in um, our agriculture. And he cites uh, a garden in Bangladesh. And we're going to close with this one, which tells that story. And you can find it if you want to read more about it in Bill's book on page 170. As soon as we let our banjos get tuned here, because they need to do some tuning uh, between keys for different songs. You ready? How many kinds of fruit and veggies grow in a Bangladeshi garden? Looking for diversity, you really ought to go to a Bangladeshi garden. Coconut and betel nut, cardamom and cinnamon, jackfruit, okra, blackberry, guava and pomegranate, eggplant and mango, bamboo, apple, big light Rest between a palm tree, what can you see in a Bangladeshi garden? All within an acre with a wise caretaker, a Bangladeshi garden. Fish and ducks and chicken poop, chicken eggs and chicken poop, spiraling fertility. The earth's getting hotter, so tend the soil and water like a Bangladeshi garden. Thank you. Thank you. See you in the morning. Thanks for staying.